You are listening to the Prepared Warrior Podcast, where law enforcement and military trainers discuss cutting-edge training, tactics, and technology. Here is your host, John Wilson. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 4 of the Prepared Warrior Podcast. I'm John Wilson. Our guest for this episode is Alan Stevie. I like to start every episode with a quote. This one is from Richard Strozzi Heckler, who said, The path of the warrior is lifelong, and mastery is simply staying on the path. All right, now it's time to introduce a special guest we have on today's program. Alon Stevie is the CEO of Direct Measures International, a provider of security consultancy, tactical training, and protective services to the private and public sectors. He is a recognized authority on security, dignitary protection, travel security, counterterrorism, mass violence prevention, and survival, and uh, uh, a whole list of uh, other, you know, amazing credits and things he's uh, done in his life. So, first, uh, thanks so much for coming on the program. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, first, uh, can you tell us a bit more about your background and what led you into uh, the training field? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I was uh, actually born in France and immigrated to Israel when I was a young boy and then uh, grew up in Israel uh, where I was a refugee of war in 1973 and then uh, subsequently got into uh, Israeli uh, fighting and uh, survival system called Hisadut, which means uh, literally survival in Hebrew, developed by uh, person or a grandmaster called Dennis Hanover. And that system was developed specifically to train people how to survive and combat the threat of terrorism in Israel, which has been a long uh, standing problem, as you know. Right. And uh, the Hisadut system has been developed in parallel to what uh, another system that a lot of people know called Krav Maga. So there were two main systems uh, of fighting came out of Israel. One is Krav Maga and one is uh, Hisadut. And he said that uh, has been taught to uh, special operator, governmental agents, and uh, school of anti-terror for many years, as well as to a chain of schools in Israel. So I grew up training in his subdues from the age of nine, and uh, I've been doing that for uh, well, well over 40 years now. And then it was a natural evolution for me to um, go into the Israeli Defense Force Combat uh, Intelligence Unit. So it's a special force unit. Uh, that I uh, joined and uh, seen action in Lebanon 1982, uh, fighting uh, extremism, uh, Hezbollah particularly was on the rise at that time when they first moved into Lebanon. So had uh, some experiences uh, back then fighting terrorism. And uh, after I got out of the military, I uh, decided that it'd be a good idea to come to the United States and uh, teach American how to survive terrorism you know, over 30 years ago. Back in those days, uh, most people couldn't even spell the word properly. Obviously, things have changed, uh, certainly after 9-11. So I had the privilege of uh, working with various uh, special unit outfit in uh, the U.S. military, including uh, U.S. Navy SEAL CQB instructor. Uh, I trained uh, with them and trained them uh, in the 94-95 year period uh, here in San Diego. Uh, working on all kind of uh, tactical application of uh, what I knew would work from my experience and of course what they were teaching to the SEAL teams. And then from there evolved the relationship uh, into uh, training various law enforcement agencies, uh, various uh, special or rapid response teams, SWAT teams, and so on and so forth in the emergency space. Uh, in Southern California primarily, as well as other states like Colorado, and um, formed the company called Direct Measures, which has been in existence since uh, 2000, uh, before 9-11, with the focus of uh, training uh, um, first responders, as I mentioned, tactical training, mm-hmm. as well as uh, providing the security training to uh, non sworn personnel. Uh, about surviving terrorist attack, uh, active shooter. Uh, the company also provides uh, security consultation and security auditing to Fortune 500 companies, schools, uh, hospitals, uh, places of worship. And um, we also do uh, dignitary protection, primarily overseas, 
uh, to uh, you know traveling executive or uh, celebrities and uh, politicians who operated in over 30 countries around the world in security operation. So I um, uh, put together all these vast experiences and know-how and, uh, and learning uh, practical uh, aspects of what works and what doesn't work in the real world and uh, created several programs. And one of them is, uh, which is funded and uh, certified, the only one of its kind, certified by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it's a course called Mass Violent Prevention and Active Shooter Survival. It's the only one of its kind listed on the state and federal training catalog. And uh, we teach that course to uh, uh, businesses, to schools, to uh, hospitals and places of worship uh, in response and prevention of the active shooter threat, which is, as you probably know, on the rise uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Right. Even where you are uh, right now uh, in California, there was a, a large... Uh, you know, mass casualty event at uh, Garlic Festival. Um, yep, yesterday. Just, just yesterday, yep. yeah. So uh, I saw that the response, uh, you know, the the threat was neutralized in about one minute. Do you, so how, how do you kind of, do you, do you see these events and kind of analyze the response and see what worked and and, uh, and kind of evaluate your, your training based on, you know, the kind of evolving threat? Absolutely. That's a must for anybody who teaches uh, life-saving skills, right? You cannot uh, teach based on theory and uh, what you think may work. It has to be based on reality. Uh, reality-based training has to be based on lessons learned from the incident themselves. Uh, in 2004, I've done an extensive study uh, uh, as part of a think tank here at the University of California of Irvine at a Central Bank Commission Security Affair, which I'm a board member of, and we've studied back then, 2004, all active shooter incidents that have occurred up to that point. I mean, literally studied every uh, bullet that was fired, who fired it, when, who it, if, if it hit anybody, if it missed, why it missed, how long it took, I mean, all the details. And back then the conclusion was, and is still relevant and is today, that uh, in most active shooter incidents, most casualty occur within the first 10 minutes prior to law enforcement intervention. So the intervention yesterday of within a minute response, taking out the shooter was fabulous and was uh, effective and was not the norm, right? Uh, it's typically not the case. Most active shooter incident end with either non-law enforcement, people intervening and acting against the shooter or the shooter killing himself as he hears first responder approaching the area. So yesterday's response, as I said, was fabulous, was effective. They saved lives undoubtedly uh, by putting their life on the line, by the way, and uh, took out the shooter in a timely manner. Uh, however, we can't count on that being the case every time, right? And the history has shown us, as I mentioned, that it is not the case. So. We need to train people on site how to act in self-preservation in the first 10 minutes of an active shooter incident, which is what our program does. Yeah, so you, you train, you know, civilian and uh, business, um, you know, business workers. And uh, it's just a wide gambit, I guess, of going from training, you know, police and, and to regular civilian. What are what are the main differences you got to look out for when when training people who who are used to uh, you know the high stress uh, events and and those who are not yeah it's a great question so of course there's a difference uh, i started the training actually not by training the the uh, people on site the, 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 the civilian i i i started uh, addressing the issue by uh, developing a course that's called Terrorism Responder. We find it online, terrorismresponder.com, mm -hmm. to which we train first responders in multiple states. Uh, it's an intensive course, uh, force on force and live fire that trains officers how to respond effectively and aggressively uh, to an active shooter situation. But in so doing, uh, you know, we came to the conclusion that it wasn't enough, that there was still a gap that needed to be addressed with training 
to provide uh, a better chance of survival for those on, on, on site, the affected population during an incident. So that's why we developed uh, the program that I mentioned, uh, Mass Violent Prevention Active for Survival. And of course, there's a difference, the difference is in the mindset to start with, right? Most civilians have no idea what a gunshot sounds like. Most civilians have no idea how to operate, think, under the rest. I mean, now a lot of officers are properly trained and know how to do that. Some officers, uh, you know, need to get more training to become more effective, but there's a big difference in the mindset here. So that's the first thing. Secondly, as far as the use of force, most civilians are adverse to that. They, 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 I mean, when you train people at school, for example, which we've done thousands, uh, you're dealing with, uh, you know, um, uh, female uh, substitute teacher uh, who may be 60 years old or, or older sometimes. And uh, you have to take that person from being afraid to even talk about the subject to being willing to do whatever it takes to stop a shooter coming to that door. And, and the technique and the tactics that we teach, although they're based on practical lesson learned from the tactical world, they are um, well if you would translate it uh, by me into simple effective moves and process of thinking that anyone can learn and adopt and use in real time so yeah we had to do adaptation in the way we teach we had to do adaptation in the way we teach it and then of course in what is taught as far as the tactics and the techniques considering the the limited uh, knowledge and understanding that uh, non swarm personnel have so uh, what about um, uh, prevention of, of these kind of uh, events? Would you say, um, you know, the, the appearance of, you know, visible guards and security can be a big deterrent uh, for a possible attack? Or how do you kind of try to avoid being a target? Well, another great question. And, you know, you have to consider prevention together with response, they, 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 they work together, right? And so we, from the outset, when we decided to develop the course, I, I, I thought if I'm gonna have the platform to teach people how to respond and survive, I might as well teach them how to prevent the whole thing from happening in the first place. So uh, as, as, uh, half of our program teaches prevention in a very effective manner. And, and as part of teaching prevention, I also teach principle and the basic concepts of security, right? Remember, I'm a security consultant. I've designed security system for school, houses of worship, hospital businesses. Mm -hmm. So I'm very familiar with how security works. And the most important component of every security system is not the technology, is not the camera, is not the access control, the alarm. It's the people that it's intended to protect. If you have a security system, but the people on site don't follow procedures and protocol and don't use it properly, it's useless. So we train as part of our uh, program against active shooter here, how to use security system, whether it's camera or whatever else system is in place, to identify and then respond more effectively and quickly to an intruder, an active shooter or any type of intruder. Uh, you know, when you look at and you ask me about the terrorists, when you look at security, there are basically five uh, elements of security the way I teach them, right? The first element is detail. Second one is detect. The next one is deny. And then there is delay. And last but not least, there is defend, right? right. And if you think about security, it's always done, if you do it correctly, it's done in rings or layers of security, right? The more the layers, the more time you have to identify the threat and uh, respond, right? So the first outside layer is always going to be the deterrence. How uh, hardened does your school or your hospital or your business or your church look like to a potential attacker? Because as we know with, for example, terrorists, there's never been a terrorist attack in the U.S. that did not involve surveillance prior to the attack. It's part of the terrorist cycle, right? So when a terrorist or a group of terrorists drive around and looking for potential target, uh, say perhaps it's a, a Jewish synagogue, they are going to drive around and study multiple synagogues to determine which one of them would be the most vulnerable, right? They always try to follow the path of least resistance. So now let's say you do not have deterrence or they were not deterred. Uh, 
then the next thing you have to be able to do is detect them and detect them as far away as possible from the perimeter, right? And detection, of course, is done and integrates technology of all kinds, like cameras, sensors, laser fences, radar, depend on the facility, and we help design and integrate all of those into one system. So the detection, but when you do the detection, you always have to ask yourself, and people oftentimes overlook this. Now you got camera, but who's watching the camera? Who's watching the monitor? Right? Who's monitoring the monitor? Uh, and part of the detection and the deterrence is also, as you mentioned, security officers and guards. If they're properly trained, They'll be able to identify and recognize behavioral anomaly, right? Because behavior is the true indicator. There's no profile of a terrorist or an active shooter. You have to know how to read people's behavior. That's how we do it in Israel. And then if your detection does not work or fail, then the, you have to deny the potential threat, the entry to the perimeter. It should have multiple layer of security, whether it's a gate on the outside, then a, then a, a gate at the entrance of the school, then the doorways, the doors to the classroom have to be able to be locked down, if necessary, totally locked down, not just turn the key uh, or close them, but actually barricade it. Right? So now that's denied. And then if you fail to deny the entry of an active shooter into the perimeter, and he's roaming around looking for people to kill, the name of the game at that point, what needs to be done is delay. You have to buy as much time as possible to delay the movement and the killing ratio of the active shooter. So anything that will frustrate, confuse the shooter and cause delay will save life. On an average, in an active shooter incident, a person dies every 10 seconds. So imagine that. If you can delay someone who is intending to kill people in a school by 10 seconds, for every 10 seconds you've done so, you save potentially a life. And then last but not least, if your deterrence, your detection, your ability to deny and delay did not work or failed, and the shooter is entering the room, is at the door, everybody on site need to know what to do to defend themselves and stay alive, right? So detect, I mean, deter, detect, deny, delay, and defend are the five basic concept and rings of security that we teach. And we teach it that way in a simple manner, just like I explained it to you, and everybody can understand that. And then people, when they understand this, okay, well, what do we have here on campus, at the school or the church, to deter, to detect, to deny, to delay, and then, of course, to defend ourselves. So it's a pretty straightforward, practical way to look at things and teach people. Yeah, that seems very clear. And, and also the idea that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of you know, high tech apparatus you have uh, set up if, if the people aren't trained to uh, to kind of uh, monitor it properly, um, it's not really going to make a difference. Right. So um, what kind of uh, would you say there's any common misconceptions that uh, people have when they're when they're training for, you know, detecting these kind of uh, events or, or defending against them? Some some things that maybe come up and train people make assumptions and and uh, they're often uh, not not correct, or or do people kind of uh, have a handle on it now? Yeah, I think uh, you know it all comes down to always information, right? It's all about knowledge, right? It's it's what we don't know that we don't know that actually get hurt, get us killed and hurt us, whether it's in in the battlefield or you know in 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 survival, wherever you may be, uh, and in life in general, right? It's all about knowledge, it's knowledge driven. So if you uh, have a misconception, if you have stereotype and you apply those to a situation, it will make you misunderstand what is going on. It will make you make, you, uh, make a mistake in identifying the true threat and therefore prevent you from applying the right uh, countermeasure uh, to the right uh, threat, right? So a lot of people think uh, or still think uh, uh, today, which is surprising to me, but they, they still think that a terrorist or uh, an active shooter looks differently, speaks funny, uh, wears something that, that will identify him as such. I, I think people have seen uh, too many movies. It's right, not like yeah. <laughs> That's why I said behavior is only the, the only true indicator. Uh, I mean, they, they don't wear 
uh, you know, uh, horns. They don't have necessarily a boca or not a boca or a certain kind of hat or certain skin color for the matter or certain type of dress. You could be sidetracked by looking at someone who has a certain race or ethnicity in a certain situation and completely miss the person standing right next to them who is the actual threat who you would normally think, oh, because of that person, uh, race or ethnicity or the way he wears his clothing, uh, that person is safe and you would ignore them. That would be a mistake. So you really have to look at what people do under the circumstance. Is that normal? Is that typical to the environment. When we teach a behavioral recognition, the first thing that I always teach is how to establish a baseline, a behavioral baseline. I tell people all the time, just become very familiar with your surrounding and, and with the activities around you. So you know, this is typical to this place. And people around here walk, they don't run. People around here don't carry big backpack. They just carry maybe handbags sometime when they come to the activities at the church, but not a big backpack. People around here during the summer don't wear trench coat because it's too hot. I mean, those are some basic examples, but then there's many more, and they're all very situational driven, right? So it's every environment is different. But when you teach that to the to to our students, we teach them how to establish a baseline. Then we teach them it's a lot easier once you have a baseline to pick up any anomalies and then pay attention to that, right? So that, that it's all information and knowledge based. For, for that reason, we also offer the training. I didn't mention it, but we offer our training curriculum online. We have an online university uh, at uh, accert.com, which provides training and uh, detailed video uh, slides, uh, download PDF, Q&A, all of that, very professionally done, about three main subjects that are of concern of mine. One, of course, is the active shooter prevention and survival. The next course that we offer is IED countermeasure and bombing prevention. And then the third course that we offer is uh, kidnapping survival and uh, hostage countermeasure. So those are available online for anybody from for anybody from all over the world to be able to get the information, the knowledge, to know how to identify, prevent, and if all else fail, respond and survive any type of those attacks. Yeah, those sound like a really useful resource. Um... Would you say, uh, I guess, interest, you know, in 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 this kind of, um, you know, prevention from these events has has uh, increased uh, in the last uh, few years since you started doing this? Uh, yeah, for, it certainly has, and there's more need for it. There's been an increase in the amount of or the numbers of incident, the number of casualties. The latest report from uh, the FBI, DOJ. Uh, reveal that, and uh, there is a, a certainly a, a growing awareness of the general population uh, for the need of what I just mentioned, and, uh, which is it's not enough to dial 911 and wait and hope for the best. And it is unrealistic to expect a first responder to be there immediately in the event of an incident, okay? It, it, it was great that it happened that way yesterday. I'm sure the officer were on the scene mm -hmm. at the onset of the incident. That's why they were so quickly to respond, which is, like I said, fantastic, but it's usually not the case. So the public has become more aware for the need of having another option until law enforcement arrive to stay alive. And and that's why there's a growing need in our program. We have a video clip that we put on YouTube in 2008. Uh, it's called Last Resort Active Shooter Survival Measure. You know, you put that as a title or put my name alone, Stevie Active Shooter Survival, and it will show up. It, it's a short clip, 8.5 minutes worth of video showing the training that we've done back then, a university student here at UCI. We filmed that clip raw is nothing edited about it uh, we did not those are not actors those are actual students who took about a half an hour worth of a brief and training for me before we did the training on site as it shows in the video and that video became the staple the standard uh video to show uh, by police department nationwide in the united states and i'm sure as well in canada as what can be done, because you have to understand when, when first responder or law enforcement are asked to provide training to schools, staff and faculty, let's say, or places of worship, about active shooter incident and what to expect, they cannot provide and deliver training 
that tells people exactly step by step what to do. That's what we do. Officers cannot do that because there's a liability associated with recommending any particular course of action. And I know you understand that. So what officers provide and are allowed to provide is information about what to expect and what to expect, particularly from the law enforcement response during the incident. But they cannot actually teach or recommend any specific course of action for survival, for liability reason. And that's where there is a gap. And that's the gap that we feel by providing step-by-step instruction on how to survive and or how to prevent such attack. And, you know, the proof of the matter of the efficiency of our program and the value of it uh, is, of course, the fact that we are the only one who are DHS certified, right, nationwide, uh, to teach this program. So I recommend people to, to get a sense for what that program is about to go look at that video online. That is, of course, on YouTube free uh, to get a sense of what we do. And uh, if you want to just use that video to show anyone in your jurisdiction, uh, please feel free to do that. That's why we'll put it out there to help save more lives. And, but if you want to take the training to the next level, you know, take the course online or better yet, what we have and we want to encourage is uh, we have a train the trainer program. And in my mind, the most qualified or some of the most qualified potential instructor to teach this to the community will be first responder and law enforcement officer that are authorized by their department to do so. So they can go in and provide more than just general advice uh, of, of what to expect to inactive shooter. So they can actually teach the only program that's approved to be taught by the federal government on what to do and how to survive. So we have a, a push on active uh, uh, promotion to uh, encourage uh, law enforcement officer uh, as well as firefighter if there is uh, an interest uh, anywhere to become an instructor with us to our train the training program and then deliver the training to uh, people uh, everywhere yeah that's a great resource and we'll provide a link to the uh, to that video as well on our on our uh, prepared warrior website um, so is there any anything else like um, I, I kind of wanted to ask you just like what motivates you personally uh, in kind of continuing to, to do this kind of uh, uh, conducting these training courses and, and kind of always learning about, uh, you know, potential threats like what what keeps you uh, involved in this? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a great question. Uh, I've been doing this for a very long time, right? I've been teaching survival, fighting martial art and combat skills uh, well over 30 years. So to me, there's nothing more rewarding than saving life to education, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Knowledge that can help people live another day, uh, have a productive, happy life, uh, make our society safer, more resilient. That That's my life's mission and goal. And aside from that, it's interesting to me. I mean, it's, it's never a dull moment. You always have to think ahead of the enemy, right? Uh, out think, outsmart the bad guys and figure out what's next. And as you know, they're evolving. They're gonna come up with the next type of attack or weapon that they could use to create mayhem and murder and, and kill innocent people. And th that's wrong. And we need to step up to the plate as a society and, and, and together, not separate. You know, there's, there's a bit of a disconnect in some part of the country between the general population and law enforcement, there's like this animosity perhaps in some part of the uh, you know population. It's us versus them, you know, the civilian, non-sworn personnel versus sworn personnel. This is ridiculous. We are all in this together. Every first responder, police officer, firefighter who puts their life on the line, he or she are doing it for everyone else's sake. And, and, and heroes is the only name uh, that you can call these people sacrifice. Few people are willing to run toward the sound of gunfire mm -hmm. under any circumstance, right? And so instead of appreciation and respect, we got some discontent and disgruntled attitude toward law enforcement. This needs to change in order for society to become safer. And on the flip side, law enforcement has to come to the realization that there is never going to be enough of us, eyes and ears, to be able to prevent and respond to every single incident that's going to continue to happen anywhere in the world. So we need to, as first responder, engage the civilian population, 
in their own security and own safety and work together, find a way to work together more effectively to prevent and respond to any type of threat, whether it's a, a you know, man-made type of attack or a natural disaster, it doesn't matter. Humanity is a struggle for survival from day one, right? And, and we are here better together. We are safer together. So the more I can, uh, if, if you would, the more I can uh, promote that idea, that notion, provide the knowledge and the tools that allow people to do that, more effectively to be safer together, uh, the happier it makes me. So this is where I'm coming from. Right. All right. Well, um, uh, last thing, is there anything um, you have planned for the future or are you, are you just uh, continuing to, to do what you're doing or what's uh, what's the future hold? <laughs> well, the future is always bright and uh, the future hold more challenges uh, that, that uh, for me are really opportunities to do good and uh, I'm uh, from a practical standpoint, we want to uh, reach and train at least a million people online this uh, next year and then train as many trainers as possible to deliver this message and this life saving knowledge to communities in the United States, in Canada, everywhere around the world where free people live. All right, Alan Stevie, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This has been the Prepared Warrior Podcast. For more info on our guests or other episodes, check out thepreparedwarrior.com. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the Prepared Warrior Podcast, email j-o-n at thepreparedwarrior.com.